we are de delighted since episode 45 which is our 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 physiotherapy special our physiotherapy episode and we craig and i are big we, we, we're big fans of physios I, I did a bit of a count beforehand and of, of our 45 episodes at least eight or nine have have been essentially with physiotherapists so um uh, we're, we're big fans of a lot of my closest personal friends in life are, are physios. It seems I can't get away from them. So we figured let's, let's, let's invite some of the, the big hitters, the big social media um, presences within the physio world. Tom, Hamish, mm -hmm. Kevin, Neil, uh, all of you, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know you're busy guys. I know some of you have got up very early. Some of you have just finished clinic, uh, et cetera. So yeah, ma massively appreciate you being here. And what we want to talk about and tease out and, and pick out is, is, the sort of physiotherapy podiatry uh, relationship um, that, that, that we know, or at least we hope we all know, is, is, is a very beneficial thing to us as, as clinicians and also um, to, to our patients, to our athletes, to our, um, we shouldn't call them patients. I know Neil doesn't like us doing that. We'll call them indiv to individuals, the, the people receiving the care. And I thought we might start just by getting a feel for your own individual experiences with podiatrists and podiatry as a whole just so we can kind of know where, where we're where we're coming from um and then craig and i can we can give a back and forth of experience with the o's and then we know where land lies and we can use that as a springboard so um i might just start with tom um being uk based i i, I i'm more familiar with the uk model than i am elsewhere so we'll start with you if it's okay tom and just give us a bit of feel for your experience with podiatrists, podiatry, do you currently work with one? Have you never worked with one or, or something in between? Um, I, I've worked with quite a few um, or interacted with quite a few through the courses and things and um, always, always found it really, you know, interesting to see the different sort of skill mixes and things. And I, and I do think you, you guys have a, um, a different skill base to us and a different knowledge base as well from, at least from my experience, chatting with, uh, with podiatrists. And I think that's a good thing. Then between the two different professions, I think we can team up really quite well. Um, I think in a similar way, I expect that podiatrists maybe find, like it can be difficult to find someone locally who's on a similar clinical wavelength to you. In the same way, I expect there are podiatrists that perhaps have found physios that are just doing massage and ultrasound and maybe that isn't really what you want to recommend your patients to. Um, it's similar. Sometimes I find it difficult to find a podiatrist that's on a similar wavelength in terms of being, you know, evidence based and things. So I think it kind of probably works both ways. Sometimes that both professions will have a bit of a mixed experience in terms of, you know, local clinicians and whether we're on the sort of same page with things really. But I would say predominantly it's been, you know, a very positive, you know, positive experience working with them. And um, if you can find a good way of teaming up locally, it tends to work pretty well. Perfect. And by the way, I should have said from the start, you don't have to just say positive things, negative comments, totally. This is, a, you're in, you're in a, a circle of trust. This is a, this is a safe place. Um, Kevin, can I come to you? Because I, I have to confess, I have uh, no knowledge of Norway and the way things work there at all. So I might come to you next and ask the same question if that's okay. Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm not, I'm not completely sure. I've just, I've, uh, I've worked clinically for about two years. Um, and I've always worked in the private sector. Uh, and to be honest, I hope I don't offend any Norwegian physios now that work closely with uh, the digest, but I haven't really worked that closely with anyone yet. So um, I'm actually here to learn a bit more about what you guys do and, uh, uh, yeah, to, to learn more about that, actually. Um, it's going to be my answer. Perfect. Perfect. Um, Craig's a great teacher here. We happily teach you what podiatry is all about. Um, uh, Neil, let's come to you because um, I know your your accent will give it away. Although you're you're in in, in sunny Australia, you're you're not from there originally, as we know. So I'm not sure how much you've worked one place and the other. So talk talk me through your your background. Um, I, I guess I should start by saying that I'm not working clinically anymore. So I moved out of um, private practice just over a year ago. So I'm now in back in academia. Um, I had my own practice for nearly two years. Um, and in that time there, I, I didn't work with any podiatrist, but I think that was more a reflection of my, my business and what I was trying to um, achieve there. My first role out of uni in a private practice setting, we used to prescribe orthoses to pretty much every patient that came in with um, lower limb issues. So 
although it was never discussed, it was almost, um, I feel, and I might not necessarily be sharing a, a view um, representative of everybody, but I, I feel that we were doing what we would have perceived the podiatrist would have done anyway. Um, that may not be correct, but that's, that was part and parcel of what we were doing as physiotherapists. But outside of that, my um, clinical working relationship with, with podiatrists has been next to zero. Perfect. We'll definitely come back to one of those points for sure, because uh, I think it's important to, to talk about that more. Um, last but not least, Hamish, talk, talk us through where you're coming from. Yeah, so um, I've been a physio for uh, around 12 years and only around uh, probably two or three of those years I worked at a sort of multidisciplinary clinic where we had a couple of podiatrists um, working with us. Um, you guys, uh, Ian and Craig, you probably know uh, Daniel Bagnall um, through online chats. Yeah. Uh, so I worked at Daniel, who's a, a very good podiatrist, well, in, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, I, I found that... Um, I learned a lot through him. Uh, you know, we'll probably talk about some different things over the over the course of this. But um, yeah, interesting to actually work in clinic with someone, be able to sort of um, bump ideas off each other um, when treating foot, ankle, knee. Um, yeah, so I've had a had a little bit of experience with podiatrists. Perfect, Craig. You and physios, talk me through it. I don't think I've ever asked you this question. Are you expecting me to answer a question? <laughs> yeah, I'm bringing you in. 45 oh. weeks in, I thought I'd mix it up. <laughs> oh, jeez, I have to. Th oh, um, you caught me off guard there, Ian. Well, you uh, tell you what, you have a thing. You have a thing, and I'll, I can say about my experience. Yeah, I'll come back to it. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'll, I'll give you a few minutes to get. I was actually, just, try, I was actually just trying to work out how many kilometres um, Hamish is away from me. Um, I mean, uh, I'm, glad you're head, I'm, I'm glad your head's in the game. That's good. That's good to know. Um, <laughs> I'm actually I'm at Box Hill, Hamish, so it's not far away, but yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, um, speaking of so Daniel, he's now up Neil's way. <laughs> so yeah. I work with with I work within multidisciplinary teams, which are predominantly physiotherapy. So I'm often the podiatrist in visualize it like the podiatrist in the physio clinic. And I do this in three separate clinics and have done since about 2006. So pretty much been surrounded by physios uh, for a, a good 12 years and counting. And like, like I said, my, some of my best friends inside work and outside work as such are physios. And, and I, I think the way I think has genuinely fundamentally changed as, as a result of being around them. And the reason I follow all of you guys and, and others um, and previous guests that we've had on from the physio world is because of working with physios on a daily basis. You just expose yourself to it and you become more exposed to it. I'm, I'm going to the physio conference in, in Birmingham in the UK uh, next week. And uh, yeah, I, I just don't see how I could ever not work alongside physiotherapy for reasons that we'll, we'll talk out as, as the episode goes on. But um, it still amazes me the way when I speak to podiatrists who do musculoskeletal work and don't work either with or at least have some communication with a physio. I don't, I don't see how that works personally, given what the physios bring to the table that I don't think we can and, and hopefully vice versa. So that's my, my position. My, you know, that's where my, my bias is. I'm, 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 I'm pro physio. There's no denying it. Um, Craig. Talk me through yours. You've had enough time to think now, unless you've been Googling something else. Yeah, 6.5 6 kilometres. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's how, that's how far we are, Hamish. <laughs> no, there's, probably, there's probably 200 podiatrists and 200 physios between us. Yeah, I know, yeah. No, look, I'll, I'll have to be honest. My, my experience of working with, with directly with physiotherapists in various clinics goes back quite a very, very long time ago before I sort of went down the academic pathway. And it really is quite interesting reflecting on that now because then it was all the electrotherapeutic modalities. That was pretty much it. Very, very, um, very little emphasis on exercise. Uh, probably manual therapies was just starting to get a bit stronger back then. So it's kind of interesting to see where, well, not only where podiatry has come from since that time, but where, um, whoops, I've, can you... I don't know whether you can still hear me. Uh, my video has stopped. Yep, can still hear you. I'm still here. Okay. Oh, and I've lost my green screen. <laughs> okay. Um, 
I don't know what happened then. Someone just unplugged me. But anyway, I'll keep... It's no. almost like you really don't want to answer this ah. question, Craig. No, there, it's back better now. <laughs> no. So no, I'm just saying, it's interesting where, where podiatry has come from since then, as well as where physiotherapy has come from since then. Um, yeah, both are very, very different professions in, in, in say, the more progressive circles. So, yeah. yeah, so let's, let's, let's talk about that because... We as podiatrists, as, as Neil sort of touched on, we might have a reputation. The elephant in the room here is that we might have historically, rightly or wrongly, been given a reputation for, for dishing out orthoses indiscriminately. Go and see the podiatrist, you're going to get orthoses. Um, I think I'm right in saying that, that your version of that is that every single person you see, you're going to do something for their glutes. Is that a reason why we have a bit of banter in our clinic that, that someone says, um, I'm going to send someone to you. You need to give them a pair of your, we call them meat pies. We need to give them a pair of your meat pies. Uh, and I say, well, I'll send it back to you and you can give him some banded crab walks, you know, and it's just a bit of a lighthearted banter. But I mean, is it, is it fair to say, well, it is fair to say that our professions have moved on massively since then. What, what are some of the things about physiotherapy that you guys would, would not want people to think of you. So there are going to be podiatrists watching or podiatrists out there that have never worked with physios. They might have these opinions of what a physio is and what they do. Um, and you know the kind of I the, the arguments that you have within your profession about um, things like manual therapy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let me come to Kevin first, because you've got a huge following on social media. Uh, I, I assume they're not all physiotherapists, but because uh, I know I follow you and I'm sure other other professions do you strike me as, as someone who's worked very very hard to promote the profession um as it is present day and try and move away from those kind of uh, chains of, of, of historic kind of thought talk me through what are some of the other things you'd really want people to know about your profession where it is now and, and not where it has been yeah that's a that's a that's a good question um i think that uh, it's not uncommon that um, we see at these patients in the clinic that um, that mostly uh, look at us like massage therapists or that that's the primary treatment that we give to someone. Um, and that's something I, I think all of us are, are trying to change that uh, perception maybe. So um, at least that's something that I would like people to think differently of physios. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is that and, a, and actually, we, question? yeah, it is. And we just, I just had a comment from, from a colleague, a, a podiatry colleague, Andrew, who, who said, I mainly carry out exercise rehab and occasionally prescribe orthoses. The physio down the road mostly rubs people and um, prescribes a lot of orthoses. Have we swapped roles? Um, and we're, gonna, we're, <laughs> we're, we're definitely going to talk about the kind of overlap within our professions uh, later for sure. Um, I think that's uh, that's a great point. Um, yeah, you guys are definitely you know, people's belief may have been if they're going to see a physio, they're going to they're going to have a bit of a rub. And, and I know from following uh, from following you guys that, that that that's that's far from the truth. Let me slightly re rejig the question and bring it to you, Tom, because you, another person who I know works tirelessly on social media and and, and pr you know and teaches courses to to multiple uh, people over the course of the year and. Um, really really at the front of kind of promoting your profession when it comes to the the sort of the historic belief that when, when someone comes in to see you or when, when, a, when a, a clinician is referring someone to you and they pretty much said to you you need to go to see the physio because you need some you need a bit of a rub down uh, manual therapy call it what you will how do you how do you approach that if with the person and then the, the client, the patient, you, then also then the, the relationship with that, that clinician. Yes, it's a, it's a difficult one sometimes. Um, I apologise if I cut out a little bit. My, uh, our internet connection seems to be a bit unstable this end. Um, but yeah, it, it, it is difficult when someone's coming to you with a set expectation. You know, they're, they're coming in, and we get this sometimes before we've even been able to ask them probably already saying well you know you're going to get in there and give it a rub or you're going to, i need to manipulate it or you know they're already making it clear what they want and that, that can be difficult and i think um then it's about sort of working out what's actually you know in the best interest for the patient and having an honest and open discussion with them and saying whether you feel what they're they're you know suggesting has a role in that package and it, it is difficult sometimes because if someone is 
adamant they need a specific treatment and you deny them it, it is difficult to get them on board afterwards. But equally, we're there to give the patient what's going to be most effective, which isn't necessarily always what, you know, exactly what they want. Um, but I think then that's, again, it's about communication with the person that's referred in, isn't it? So, Oops. Uh, maybe a different professional. So, oh yeah, go and see Tom, he'll give, he'll give you a good rub. Then I'd be inclined to say to them, well, you know, this isn't really what we want you to be doing here. There's, there's more to, to us than that. Um, you know, we give out glutes exercises too, you know, so it's not just about giving people an odd. <laughs> yeah. Actually, but yeah. that, but that, that raises a really interesting question about e expectations. And if they have a different expectation that we have to re-educate them on, is that going to impact the outcome? Yeah, it's, it's tricky, isn't it? It's tricky to know, like, and, and it's, it, you know, one part of, our, of my training, because I worked in chronic pain for quite a while, we did motivational interviewing. And part of that was this idea, they talked about rolling with resistance, so not, not coming up against the patient. And how do you do that then if, if they're requesting a treatment that you don't think is likely to be effective? How do you not come up against that? So I think, I think it is a bit difficult sometimes, and it's, it's a gray area. I don't think it's always very, very clear exactly what role to go down. But if someone very strongly expects something to help and you feel it may have a role in their treatment, I think it's reasonable to include that mm -hmm. if you think it actually may have a role. Um, but there are times where, and we've had someone in clinic just this week, had a, you know, a year plus of manipulative therapy elsewhere, coming in saying they need more from me and it hasn't worked uh, for a year. So it's, it's not really helping them to, to say, yeah, let's just do more of that. And so we've got to have that honest and sometimes difficult conversation that, that says, well, look, is this working for you? Um, and then when they said, well, actually, you know, probably it isn't that hopefully opens things up. So, well, let's, let's try a different approach. Yeah. Actually, can, can I just ask Tom with a, with a, say a, a, a typical patient, perhaps like that, what, what percent do you lose? not come back because of the, you, you didn't meet what they wanted or were expecting. I mean, hopefully you, you, you're right and what you do is successful, but. Uh, um, sorry, I lost you a bit there, Craig, but um, I think if you're saying what, um, what percentage do we lose? I, I don't know. I don't kind of track the, the percent that are lost to follow up, but I'm certain I definitely have lost some. I, I've had some who've even said to me, when you're going through the subject, if they said, well, I've tried loads, you know, Achilles tendinopathy being an example, well, I've had loads of massage and, and things on the calf and the Achilles and it hasn't worked. So I've come to you for something different. And you've, yeah. you know, we've talked them through a progressive rehab program and we've got to the end and they said, well, what, you're not going to give me a rub? <laughs> and I said, well, well, we sort of established that doesn't work for you. And they're like, well, I still thought you'd want to, you know, at least give it a little bit of a rub. Um, and then have chosen not to rebook as a result. So even though they've made it clear it isn't working for them, they've still you're not disappointed. They're still disappointed they haven't had it. So it, it is hard sometimes. I think you know, and we, I, I, I would, I think we all probably lose some in those situations. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We we have uh, we have similar expectations. People coming into us, you know, they whether they've been set by a clinician or whether they're just a, a belief they have themselves, but that we haven't, you know, well, Craig's kind of just brought something out here. We're, people come to us to be realigned. They come to us, they expect orthoses, they expect uh, realignment. And, and uh, your point, Tom, about motivation interviewing is a great one because I recently listened to a podcast by um, Jared Hall and Ben Cormack and Mark Cargella, um, the critical thinking podcast, which I'm, I'm really enjoying because it's not something we as podiatrists have a load of, of knowledge on. And they talked about this writing reflex. So if we, if we're too, quick, if someone comes in with a really strong belief, albeit an incorrect one, if we're too quick to, you know, be human and correct them as we often are, we 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 we're highly likely to break down any chance of building what 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 I think Ben referred to as a therapeutic alliance. I'm still learning some of, some of this stuff myself. And, and that's hugely linked to outcomes. So I think that's a, that's a really, really good point about, about how, we, how we sort of tread those waters and things. Um, let me just bring the same question in to bring, bring in one of the other guys, if that's okay. Uh, Hamish, anything else to add? Any, any other sort of beliefs about physio that you know are out there that you, you're, you're, you feel strongly about enough to sort of say, I want to educate people away from these beliefs? Um, I think the guys have brought up a, a lot of the stuff. Um, yeah, I suppose a lot of um, we do have the 
um, that people were just coming to see us for some manual therapy, um, some re, re, relocating that sublux cuboid potentially. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> he went there. He went there. <laughs> Actually, I, I know just, just on that, <laughs> we are at some stage going to do a whole episode on the cuboid. Um, once we work out who will get on to talk about it, but yeah, <laughs> we hey Craig, we haven't agreed to that yet. I haven't oh. yet agreed to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, I think uh, everything's been brought up. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, I, I really think, you know, a lot of it comes down to load management. We're all talking about load these days, and um, I often will get. Uh, clients that come from a podiatrist and oh, the new podiatrist uh, said the old podiatrist orthotics or orthoses weren't the correct ones so they've given me these new ones but there's, there hasn't been any load management, there's been no strengthening yeah. so, the, so things like this we, we'll probably discuss but um, that's where I find yeah. it Yeah, we'll definitely talk, come on to load management um, Neil, I won't ask you the same question, I'll modify it slightly. Off the back of what we've talked about, podiatrists watching that, that are thinking about calling up the physio uh, in the local town and saying, let's meet for a coffee and let's work together, let's share patients. We know that we're going to come on to talk about why we think, why we as a group think that's good for us as individuals, clinicians and good for patients. What advice would you give to them when they're looking for people to build relationships with and networks with? How do we spot a... a if I dare use the word, a good physio, uh, quote unquote, from a from a um, a poor one. Oh wow, that's a really interesting question and a challenging one to answer. I think that um, depends on your understanding of, I guess, current what would be considered best practice. If you don't know what that is, you wouldn't be able to spot it when it's there or not. Um, I think in terms of building relationships, absolutely go for it. Um, but this this almost came up in conversation at the Big Arts Conference last weekend at Manchester, Eric Merrow was talking about people's area of specialisation. Absolutely, I agree with you, Ian, that the physios should, if there's an opportunity, they should be working with a podiatrist because we, from an educational point of view, we just don't have that knowledge and experience to work with um, feet and ankles and lower limbs in the way that you do. And I think it would be crazy not to work with a podiatrist. It doesn't make any, any sense. Um, so I think if there's an opportunity for a, a physio to work with a podiatrist and they're on the same um, wavelength in terms of the way that they want to help people, then, then go for it. Um, I think a, a conversation would be an easy starter to work out whether that's somebody that you do feel comfortable with and that they do have similar clinical ideals. So you won't know until you test the waters, but do it would be my recommendation. But as Eric said last weekend, it really depends on the nature. If you're a physio, particularly here working in a rural setting and there is no podiatrist, then you don't have that opportunity. But as Hamish said, if there's a number of physios and a number of podiatrists, then, then I think in the, in the person's best interest, then you should be working together. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah, but I think something something you said. Uh, sorry yeah. to jump in, but we, we've actually just been we've oh, just been interviewing recently for a podiatrist at our clinic, which has been quite interesting because we we want to you know we want to bring a podiatrist into the team, um, and that's been quite interesting because of course how do you as a physio interview a podiatrist to know if they're right for the role? Um, but uh, but it's you know it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Like how do we define best practice? I guess is you know is part of it in a way. And I, I, I sort of get a feeling for it off people. Like when you're chatting to them and you, you know, uh, Ian and I, we've chatted before about quite a few things, you know, you, I, 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 you know, we feel confident sending someone to you, you know, and have done, in fact, you know, um, so, but do you, you know, it's trying to get that, get to know that person allows you to know whether you feel they're, they're practicing in a similar way, isn't it? And I suppose the only way you can do that is to, you know, meet up and chat and learn about them and see if you're on the same page, I guess. Actually, Tom, I've, I've got some advice for you if you're interviewing for a podiatrist. Here's a screenshot that yeah. I, took, I took from Hamish's <laughs> Website, <laughs> you know, when interviewing a podiatrist, you follow in and Craig Wright. That's Neil. Yes, I'd yeah. love to work. You're in. So um, <laughs> there's there's, a, there's an cool. easy way to help help out there. <laughs> the one the one interview question. It could be the shortest <laughs> interview ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'll show you. you won't fit in here. 
I can, I'd like to share a very brief story. I had I did have a podiatrist come into to my practice, and my my feet are like pancakes. I, I overpronate. <laughs> um, they're like pancakes, and um, I had <laughs> bad feet at the time. And, and I asked him, I said, "What, what do you think of the feet?" And um, I, I made a judgment based on his facial expression. <laughs> <'Cause> I, <laughs> <laughs> conversation went no further <laughs> this is a this is an interesting point though that we bring up we're going to come on to talk about the pros of working together but but one of the potential cons um con, that's too strong a word but one of the considerations is that as podiatrists we have been hugely guilty uh, myself very much included in this of of being very very mechanically minded of hugely focusing almost in isolation for many years on the bio within the bio psychosocial model. And the, the, my understanding of all of the psychosocial things pretty much comes from physios, physios I work with, physios I, like you guys that I follow. Um, so there is this interesting, and I don't mean to, to, to falsely dichotomize the bio and the psychosocial, I'm just sort of doing that for, for illustrative purposes, but we do have this profession within podiatry that are hugely mechanically minded and always have been bio 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 and and from what i can gather the majority of the physiotherapy world or if not all of it but maybe well certainly i don't think all of it but the vast majority far far more subscriptive to the, the bio psychosocial model is there potential is there potential conflict there do you think neil you're shaking your head I so i'll come to you first i disagree i think we're just as bad we uh, i know jack have G i been too kind Yes, um, <laughs> said this. we're in these echo chambers on, on social media and in groups like this, you, you get to chat with and listen to people that are already on the same, same, same wavelength and that's not representative of the population and, and what would be considered the norm. It just isn't. I, I see it and hear it all the time and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. We're just as guilty as uh, of still persisting with that biomedical, biomechanical model. Yeah, Hamish, you had a little shake of the head there as well, I saw. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I, I think Neil is exactly right. It, we're in sort of um, echo chambers on social media. It's really uh, probably a strong bias towards um, biomedical approach to physiotherapy. Okay, note to self, unfollow all of you immediately. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, that's fair. It's a good, good, I thought it was a good discussion point. Let's move on. So. Let's talk about some of the pros of, of multidisciplinary working. And, and that doesn't mean we're in the same clinic at the same time, or even in, in one of our clinics, we're often in the same room at the same time, myself and the physio, but, you know, in the same room as the patient. That works really well. The patients love it. But um, whether they're down the street or whether they're in the, in the room next door, just working together, sharing care of certain pathologies. Um, clear pros to the to the to the patient to the individual but like i say i said at the top of this episode my personal experience of working with physios is just how much i've learned how much i've learned about uh sort of the psychosocial factors how much i the way i take a history has even changed from working with physios because the way i i some some of the clinical tests i perform i've just robbed and plagiarized from physio colleagues um my understanding, albeit average, of proximal control is all from my physio colleagues. So, uh, Neil, you put your hand up there. I don't know if you're disagreeing with me or you want to ask a, a no, question. I was, or something. I was going to ask if you could elaborate how and what. How, what have you learned and what, what's changed? So, it, it, it's probably more of a narrative on, on, I guess, the training we get. Um, but uh, Craig will, will correct me if this isn't the case in Australia for the actually, but in the UK, um, I don't think we have anywhere near as much time, um, or at least when I was teaching, it may have changed back in early 2000s, uh, with regard to how to take a history. Um, you know, just the questions to ask. We don't, we, we don't ask, or I do now, but I never historic, go back 10 years, I didn't ask about stress. I didn't ask about sleep. Um, I'm asking all sorts of questions now that I've pretty much picked up from, from the physiotherapy world. Uh, and I don't know whether that, the podiatry training has changed, but yeah, everything, uh, load management, which, which I know Hamish referred to, not something we're really taught in, in undergrad podiatry either. So when you think about the most important things with, a, with an interaction with another human is listening, taking a history, asking the right questions, viewing them as a person, not just as a, a looking at a foot attached to the end of the person, which we're a bit guilty of, 
considering management of load. I mean, every single thing that I've mentioned there is fundamental to any musculoskeletal condition. And as podiatrists that's never worked with a physio 10 years ago, they weren't things that I did. And I'm always trying to think out what I did do. Probably just gave everyone all sources, I'm guessing. I can't remember. Um, so I see massive value as a, as a, as a clinician for doing it. And I, I think... I see value with, with, I think the patients get huge value as well. For those of you with physios, I, I can't quite remember who said they had and who said they hadn't. Um, Hamish, I think you, you'd work with Daniel. Is your experience been the same? Has your experience been the same? Um, yeah. I, I, well, Daniel, Daniel we, uh, maybe as in the way the podiatrist um, is managing through a... Well, I guess, have you seen the way they treat people change i uh, you know or is the way is the way you treat people change are we taking more from you than we're giving or is it is it is it equal yeah i think i think yeah like even with daniel uh i sort of saw a change in his treatment over the over the few years as we started to uh, you know do a more of a bps approach um yeah certainly but that's that's daniel um i'm not sure um around all, all podiatrists but yeah individual responses may vary i'm just just had a question come up i'm just seeing if it's relevant yeah actually just just on that i mean tom alluded to something earlier and i think neil referred to it well it's about obviously interacting with someone who's on the same wave, wavelength as you yeah and, and that's that's really what it what it is um yeah i guess i guess there are probably clinic, clinics out there where patients come in physios give them a bit of a rub but I just give them orthoses and the patients get sent on their way. And I guess they're, they're, that's, that's not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but clearly everyone, everyone's working well together. It's not the sort of practice I'd want to work in myself, but I mean, I guess, is that what you're alluding to, Craig? Yeah, finding someone on the same wavelength as you, if that's the wavelength you're on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can, I, can I ask you a question, question again? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, this might be a stupid question, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, if, if you see a patient that's coming into you, how, how do you see yourself? What, what separates you from, from a physio, from any of us in that, in that setting? So you, what, what separates the way we assess them, you mean? Yeah. Well, I guess the majority of what we... work with plenty of physios, so you, you would... Sort of yeah, know. yeah. The physios generally tend to send to me in the clinics I work um, mm. for the more in-depth kind of... Um, opinion on on their function so you know the bio part of the psychosocial so i'm very spoiled that i can be a little bit blinkered because i know it's being looked after by by by, by everyone in the team and then uh, as i think neil said um certainly the physios i work with some of them super super smart guys and girls um but most of them fairly comfortable to hold their hands up and say i don't really understand the foot and the way it works to the detail you guys do and even the ones that some of them just don't like the foot right i mean i'm one of my, you know, a couple of them are upper limb specialists, clearly, and, and some you know, focus on the knee, the hip, even the ones that like the feet, they always just like to pull us in and kind of go, you know, what do we think here about, you know, structure, function, etc. So we're, 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 we're hopefully bringing that to the table. That's, that's what I'd like to think I bring to the table in the teams that I work in. Yeah, that's great. Um, when it comes to reviewing orthoses, issuing orthoses, and we, we touched on this earlier, so we may as well get to it now. We talk about this overlap between our professions. So I, I, I'm a podiatrist who gives orthoses. I, I know some podiatrists who um, think that only podiatrists should give orthoses. Uh, it's, it should be our thing. We're the foot specialists. We're the only people that should be doing it. I do not share that opinion whatsoever. Um, I, I think I have no, no problem with colleagues, physios, who's Osiris, whoever they are. Uh, as long as you understand what these things are and what they're not and what they do and what they don't do and you're setting expectation appropriately, I, don't, I think the title of your profession is, is hugely irrelevant. Um, there's a growing area within podiatry of, of, of podiatrists doing a lot more of what might have been historically concerned physio things like rehab, exercise, um, prescription, mobilizations, manipulations. Maybe I could get you, your guys' take on on how you feel about that, where that, where that sits with you. What do you, what do you think about that, Kevin? Sorry, can you say that last bit again? I just wondered what you thought about the potential for there being podiatrists out there doing what might be considered physiotherapy modalities historically. So 
exercise prescription, mobilization, manipulation, etc. Um, I, I, I don't think I mind that too much, to be honest. And I think uh, that's a trend I'm seeing from different professions as well, that we're, at least in my experience, if you're, if you're evidence-based, then I, I think we're all coming closer together in a sense, if that makes, if that makes sense. So as long as, as long as you use the right explanations, um, and I, I tend to favor an active approach, but uh, I, I really don't see a problem there. Uh, and I have to be honest that uh, you and Craig are, are probably some of the uh, only, or maybe all, maybe even only the the two only podiatrists I know. So I'd be pretty comfortable <laughs> with my patients in your hands. <laughs> You need to widen your set before you judge us. I think, yeah. uh, Tom, Tom, um, Tom, because you know, UK based, you see a lot of this. What do you think about the overlap of modalities across professions? Are you for it? Are you against it? Do you have any strong opinion about it at all? Um, I was just thinking, actually, as you were chatting there, I was just wondering, you know, did uh, generally, I'm, I'm really for it, actually. You know, I think I, I'm, I'm more around like what are your skills and what do you know, what's your knowledge what can you apply rather than what what name you know what uh, profession you happen to have on your kind of work badge if you know what I mean I, I'm, I'm you know whatever gets the best outcomes for the patients I'm happy with but I was just wondering like in physio I, I wonder sometimes like we take what do we take too much on and does it sometimes dilute some of our knowledge so um I, I've seen um, from working with people that have become very very knowledgeable about psychosocial factors which you, you know I'm a fan of that sometimes it means they're not as knowledgeable about biomechanics and they've not maybe really looked into or they don't really understand kinetics and kinematics and those other things. And so it, it can be quite difficult to do all of it. And I, do, I'm, I just wonder sometimes, do we need to do all of it? Might it be better to have some people that are brilliant at biomechanics who really know the biomechanics brilliantly? They are, they are the people to go to for that. Uh, might it be better to have that sometimes? I don't know. I'm just. I was just wondering it as you were saying it, really. But I, I, I think it's good. It's good to have overlap. But I think it's also reasonable to have people that are particularly good at certain areas, and then we team up to get the best out of that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good call. Good call. Uh, Hamish. Same question. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, like Kevin said, if if we're following the evidence, whether you're a physio, a podiatrist, a chiropractor, a myotherapist, as long as you're following the principles, treating that person in front of you, um, yeah, I think we can all work together and, and treat these conditions uh, as good as anyone else, really. Um, so, I, yeah, rather than sort of excluding certain practitioners or disciplines from treating a specific condition, you know, of course, with podiatrists, you know, we haven't spoken about all the other things you guys treat, like diabetes, uh, skin conditions, um, all the things we don't see. So that, that's a big difference as well. We're, we're talking about musculoskeletal stuff here. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see any of that stuff either. Do you, Craig? I think you do, you do at, a bit in your at the wife's moment, you practice, don't you? Your circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> Craig's seeing it all at the moment. <laughs> but that, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I, know, I just saw Kylie's comment, actually. I learned, uh, the, 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 is it called the cut and clean? This yeah. is a, a common cut, cut and come again. <laughs> cut, cut, cut and come again. again. Okay. <laughs> yeah uh Jay, james is just commenting how much he loves an ingrowing toenail i don't like the way this conversation's going but yeah <laughs> go on craig um, actually just just on that i i just while, while this discussion was going on just reflecting on just what i might do now that i have learned from physiotherapists but also i've done a lot of workshops for physiotherapists and you know what uh, i'm just thinking off the top of my head without giving a lot of thought to this what they found most valuable from what I did in those workshops and it's probably like it's things like and you know what I'm talking about in the the joint axis variation stuff how that might affect muscle testing um, you know like inversion eversion strengths affected massively by where the subtalar joint axis is so teaching them where the joint axis is so a lot of that kind of stuff is that I know physiotherapists have found most interesting when I do workshops with them and I think probably what you and I are finding most interesting from when we learn from physiotherapists is the pain science side of the equation so it's just it's just different levels of expertise in different areas yeah so. yeah um 
Neil, I feel like every time I come to you, I change, I change the question. So apologies in advance for this one. But um, at what stage do you think, if, you know, if you assess someone, uh, let's, let's, I mean, it's going to be pathology specific, but at what stage are you thinking, I might bring a podiatrist in on this one. Are you thinking, let's give it two or three sessions and see how it improves. And if it doesn't improve, I'll bring in the podiatrist. Are there certain times where you're thinking day one, podiatry involvement concurrently? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Feel free to use different pathologies as, um, as, I think, I think as examples, that, if you wish. I think that very much depends on, on the setting. If you're in a, a practice with a podiatrist, um, and as Tom said, um, referring or using the people where they have an area of expertise. So from, a, from an educational perspective, I, I would suggest that the podiatrist area of expertise in the, in the foot and lower limb is vastly superior to, to ours as, as physios based on the, on the level of training. Um, so if somebody comes in and they have um, a, a foot, ankle, lower limb issue, and it, it's clearly not obvious to the, the, the physio what to do, then why would you not seek a second opinion? Um, right at, at the outset but I, I think that just depends on the access to to the person um, in my practice I, I didn't have that opportunity so I had to take that on myself um, so I, I think it just depends on the, on the setting and the relationship that you you've got with other practitioners and how comfortable or not you feel with the the presentation and how you feel you can um, address that and manage the, the, the situation and help that person in front of you. So I think it depends. As well. Yeah, it depends. Definitely. Um, Tom, anything, anything to add there from, from your perspective? What was that? Sorry. Was that directed at me? Sorry, my internet it, cut it was sorry. <laughs> you got solid, solid internet in your office shed there. Um, it's, yeah. It's, well, all, uh, it, uh, it's, <laughs> it's very patchy, I'm afraid. I, I blame I blame the local. Uh, it's all over the house. It's the same. Just cuts out randomly. Just when someone asks a really key question on, on a, uh, <laughs> it wasn't a great question. question. By the way, your office your office in the garden looks amazing. By the way, just an FYI, it means so actually for ages. Um, but yeah, <laughs> do it was the same question pointed in your direction. At what point are you thinking about bringing in a podiatrist um, when you're seeing uh, yeah certain certain pathologies? Um, yeah, I think um, I think it's it's on my mind in those pathologies that we that I don't very often. It'll be on my mind from the first session, but but depending on how they present, I might be prepared to see how things do pan out over a session or two. Um, so, for example, this week we've had um, a gentleman come in with a Morton's neuroma. Now, I might see two of those a year. Uh, they're not they're not the bread and butter of my practice i'll see lots of achilles pain lots of plantar heel pain knees hips but i don't see that very often so it's it's not an area i would say you know in any way expert in but i you know there are things you know i will assess them and see what i find and i might work with you know what i'm finding on assessment and see if they're progressing over a session or two before i might say okay well let's you know let's bring podiatry in. So I think it does, I mean, I know it's a magic answer for everything, it depends, but it does very much depend on how they're presenting. If I really don't feel like I, um, I'm in a position, you know, I'm the best person to look after them or that I've got anything to offer, then I would straight away be saying, right, let's get you off to see someone who's more specialist in this area because that's, you know, oft, often a, a best option. So it does. Perfect. Less common Let stuff me... as well more inclined oh, sorry, you cut out. sorry tom i didn't mean to interrupt there you cut out i thought you'd finished talking um oh, sorry let me let me slightly uh, flip the question on its head for kevin and hamish at what point do you guys think that we as podiatrists say someone comes to see us off you know as a first point of contact at what point do you think we should be bringing in physios for certain lower limb conditions um I'll come to you first, Hamish, because you've got more experience working directly alongside podiatry, so you might be able to draw on that. Yeah, um, I think like Tom said, it, it, does, it does depend. Um, potentially, if their knowledge of maybe some loading principles, strengthening principles um, aren't there and they, they do need a, a second opinion from uh, someone specialising a bit more in that area. Um, and then also, you know, maybe things creeping up into the knee or hip or... or back um whether or not to that or not um yeah things like that as well i suppose yeah 
Kevin, any any additional thoughts? Uh, yeah, sure. But this is where my sort of my knowledge of uh, uh, podiatry is sort of uh, a, a challenge for me. But uh, uh, I'm not so sure about. Um, so my question would be: How how skilled is a is a podiatrist usually in specific rehab and that type of thing? Uh, and if like like um, Hamish said there, in terms of loading protocols and load management and and specific rehab is if the skill set isn't that good in in that area, I would sort of recommend uh, maybe uh, uh, an experienced physio that uh, you can also flip that on, on its head and 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 say the same thing about a podiatrist that if you aren't really comfortable with the feet or your knowledge is lacking there a little bit, then you shouldn't hesitate to refer on. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Yeah, totally. No. Maybe maybe you can fill me in on, on the rehab part of that. Sorry, Neil, I didn't mean to interrupt no, no, you. No, you yeah, so my question would be: How's uh, the uh, sort of the general level in terms of in terms of specific rehab and and, and that type? Of stuff? Yeah, it's a it's a solid question. I think in podiatry, as a general rule, the answer would be poor as 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 a whole with with. Certain individuals, you know, very, very good, but that would be postgraduate study and uh, be equal to them. Um, uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with all, all, all your comments. I think it's, it depends on the people involved. Go on, Neil, you had your hand up. I think you had something really profound to say. Oh, I was say profound. <laughs> my, <laughs> my wife's a, a GP and is a podiatry practice across the, the road from her. And um, I know that if somebody comes in to see her and they've got foot and ankle issues, um, she's referred um, people over to the podiatrist and they've been given exercise prescription. Exactly what I would have anticipated that they would have got from a physio. So um, I, I think it just depends. Everything's going to depend on so many different variables and um, there's also the, the, the commercial relationship if you've got a physio and a podiatrist working in the same practice. I'm... I'm assuming there's going to be some division of labor and division of um, presentations and pathologies between the two or an expectation that the physio might take some and the podiatrist might take another. So it's a very gray area for sure. But as Hamish said, if, if two clinicians or therapists are, are following um, evidence-based practice or evidence-informed practice, then you shouldn't really be able to differentiate between the, the title that they've got. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great point. The other thing that might add a layer of complexity or potentially even sim simplify it a bit in the UK at least is the way private medical insurers cover cover certain things. So, for example, um, some insurers will only give you one session or possibly two with a podiatrist, whereas they'll give you eight with a physio. Um, so clearly if, if a, a progressive loading program is required uh, for, purely from a delivery point of view, uh, a physio's best place to, to to provide it. I totally agree with everything you said. I think I'm right in saying, and Craig, call me out on this one if I'm if I'm incorrect. But I think I'm right in saying the only evidence, published data we have, to support some kind of you know, we say when should we refer? When should a physio refer to to a podiatrist? The only evidence I'm aware of is in the world of patellofemoral pain, where we've got reasonable evidence from the the consensus meetings they have biennially that. The early referral to, or early, well, it doesn't have to be referral to a podiatrist, but early intervention with prefabricated devices is is deemed deemed um, favourable for uh, modifying pain in patellofemoral pain. And I think the interesting thing for that is, it doesn't have to be a podiatrist that does it, but if I ever get, or historically, if I ever got referred patellofemoral pain patients, uh, it was usually three, four, five months down the line when they had um, perhaps not responded to all the various other interventions and. And it was completely opposing to what the level one evidence tells us. I'm pretty spoiled to work with a couple of big uh, patellofemoral pain guys. So I, I kind of get, get, get them sent early. But Craig, can you think of any other specific I mean, pathology I, 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 where... They are, the only, the, they are the only guidelines. And I, I, there's I, nothing I, else for uh, plantar heel pain or, no, or any not, other tendinopathy that I can think no. of, is there? No, but that's probably because... So we're just going on... Done. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But I think, but I think um, right. Uh, sorry, I, I think the wording in the no, cool. the wording in the patellofemoral guidelines, I think, are, are something it's like the short, the short term use of photothoses for pain reduction are recommended, or something to that effect. 
Uh, yeah. And I take your point about, you know, it's often months and months down the track before they may get used. <clears throat> Thoughts? I've just oh, lost you. Are you still there, Craig? Yeah, I'm still here, but I just... He was throwing my internet connection, I think. That's what it was. No. no. This okay, well, internet I think... cannot cope with so many, uh, so many people. <laughs> Craig, can is there can anything I ask you we... Can my uh, internet's working? <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, I was just wondering, um, I, I just get, I'll ask this to, to uh, Ian and Craig, actually, just to you know, see what you guys think. Like, do you have, like... You know, you know, where do things sit in terms of a, like a hierarchy of, of treatments, you know, uh, for you, if you're thinking about, you know, someone presenting with foot pain, like where, do, where does, say, education or strength or load management sit, sit in there, roughly speaking? So I'd be really interested to see what you consider the priorities and see if they're similar to, to what we might consider priorities. Yeah, I, I, can, I can answer that one first. Um, I will have identical priorities to you, I think, in that um, education, load management, in equal, you know, along equal priority right at the top. Um, orthoses, footwear changes, the things that perhaps as a podiatrist we may have been uh, believed to go to first, um, for me, are, are further down the line. Now that generally speaking, because of where I work, by the time people get to me, we're probably at that level of the of the hierarchy already and the other things have been done so i'm kind of spoiled in that regard so probably one of the first things i do is look at mechanics footwear consider orthoses but that isn't the first thing that's being done for that patient and if someone comes in to see me as a first point of contact they get passed straight on to someone else and then they come back around to me once they got to that level so load management education massive for me personally i think craig's probably the same as well yeah, actually pretty, yeah pretty much the same i, I think that we um you know we, we've done a, a previous episode of this and i've written about this about the whole concept of foot orthotic dosing um so there's issues about the evidence that we might be using to interpret on foot orthoses. But I, I look at foot orthoses as nothing more than a very, very effective short to medium term load management device. Um, and yeah. they have to be designed to reduce the load in the tissue that's got a problem. And if a foot orthosis can't reduce a load in the tissue that's got a problem, then they probably shouldn't be used. The problem is they're being used to correct alignment, which may or may not be related to the load in the tissue. And that's where you know, a lot of discussion has gone on. Uh, I mean, God, how many years now? 20 years. Um, 20, people, yeah. People yeah. are still talking about realignment, uh, where it's, it's not. It's about you know, using them to reduce the load in a specific, t specific tissues. If you can't design the product to do that, you probably shouldn't be using them. So, but I see that as a short to medium term, and then it's the, the tissue capacity issues become more of a medium to long term type intervention. So it's that, you know, that, that's where the, the discussion has gone. You know, the problem is, has the evidence kept up with those, those thought processes? Well, no. <laughs> um, it may turn out to be wrong, <laughs> but yeah, let's, let's, you know, it's the, it's the moving ahead of the evidence, unfortunately. Whoopsies. I think we've lost Ian, have we? Oh, looks like it. Oh. Ian Scott. Are, are, are there any it? situations uh, any situations where those where that changes? Because one of the things I wonder, and I, I know Greg Lehman's kind of asked asked this kind of in his courses and mentioned on, on social media, like sometimes you feel like is there something specific and different I need to be doing here? Um, and that's what I often wonder with foot pathology. Is there something specific and different I need to be doing other than load? Whoops, I just... that you think with like foot level problems where you think actually this something needs something quite specific and quite different. Oh, geez, okay, we could have a whole episode on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I did actually, I like, I like simple questions. Yeah, I did actually miss a little, uh, I did actually miss the dropout. I don't know what's wrong with my internet this morning, it's quite well, bad. <laughs> Um, I missed the middle part of the question, but it's, you, see, I'm trying to think of an example. Let's just take plantar fasciitis as an example. To, to me, the key to the initial management when presenting is to reduce the load, whether through activity, etc., strapping, and a foot orthosis can do that. Now, the, the problem then becomes is a simple over-the-counter foot orthosis or a specific, which according to what evidence we have is generally 
as effective as a custom made. This is where we come to the dosing issues that I would, I would never, you know, if you look at all the research done on plantar fasciitis and foot orthoses, I would never use foot orthoses the way they were done in those clinical trials. And so am I being biased and special pleading that we shouldn't apply to that? But to me, if I was using a foot orthoses and plantar fasciitis, I always put a, elevate the lateral column, what we'd call a Morton's extension, put something under the lateral metatarsals, even if that foot's pronated, because I know that reduces the load in the plantar fascia. Problem is, the clinical trials have not been done on those types of foot orthoses designed. So if they are done, there may be no difference. If they are done, there may be a, a massive. Um, and another way of looking at it is, oh, I'm just trying to, so I'm thinking off the top of my head, I'm not sure, does that answer the question, Neil? I just sort of, I did m miss the middle part of your question. Yeah, no, no, it does. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's, I suppose, again, it's always that, that magic, it depends answer, doesn't it? You know, and I expect for the, there are going to be situations, like you say, where it does need to be something more specific than just the, you know, a more generic load management yeah. education. Yeah. Um, but, but often just a, a generic um, over the counter type device stuck in the shoes will reduce by chance the load in the tissue that's got a problem and they get better. Um, but, you know, football mechanics is extraordinarily complicated and some feet that's not going to work in. And, and um, it's just, yeah, I, I do get a bit exasperated at times, you know, reading the literature on foot orthoses research because of that dosing issue. If I, if I used a different dose of foot orthoses, the outcome of that clinical trial may have been very different. It, it may well not have been. We, we just don't know. So how, you know, when that filters into official guidelines by people who don't really understand the dosing concept and, I mean, the same applies to things like shockwave therapy, the, that you can do a study using shockwave and use a low dose and get a certain result that eventually will filter into policy recommendations, even though that should not have been used at that dose. So it's, a, it's a, something I've been paying a lot of attention to lately. So. We get it with exercise prescription dose as well in studies, don't we, where you see um, exercises using studies that are a load uh, that wouldn't be sufficient for, to create strength changes, even though the study's designed to build strength. So I suppose it's, 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 that's the challenge, isn't it? As a dosage across lots of different domains, I think. Yeah, but, that, but that's the problem, Tom, is that study will then eventually filter into policy guidelines and clinical guidelines, even though it was done at the wrong exercise dose. And that's why I, I just, it's, well, it's a lot more than just foot orthosis. That's the one I tend to focus on. Sorry, I dropped out for a minute there, so I completely missed that little uh, that little yeah. discussion. It sounded it sounded awesome though. Um, Craig, just everything. looking at the yeah, yeah, I thought we might have done. Yeah, I thought you might have done in my absence. That 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 happens a lot when I'm not around. Things tend to work. And um, I'm conscious of the time. Is there anything we need to? Any questions that have come in on the Facebook group, Craig? That we need to yeah, there, pressing there things that we one, need to. There's one from Kylie, and I, again, it may take a while to address, but I'm just finding it. Um, and, and it goes back to, to our topic earlier on. It was about, um, say for argument's sake, that you, a physiotherapist is managing a patient, refers them to a podiatrist, or, and vice versa. But Kylie's got asked this interesting question, what would you do if I modified your plan? Um, again, <laughs> nice one. It was that deep. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether anyone wants to have a go at addressing that. <laughs> Say that again, Neil, I missed that. It, what would my plan be if I'm referring to the podiatrist? Wouldn't I be referring for you to come up with the most appropriate plan? It doesn't make sense that I would plan what you do. Yeah, true. I mean, I guess the way I'd word that question is, what if you'd kicked off the, the rehab uh, the, the the rehab side of this, and you'd you'd say go and see my my colleague because I just want to get an opinion on whether there's any significant mechanical drivers to this. And then whilst they're for that opinion, they modified your, your, you know, they told the patient to do something different exercise-wise. That's the way I read that question. I'm, yeah. I'm correct. How would you sort of uh, address that kind of scenario? Um, I would imagine that could be resolved with a, a conversation. Yeah. Um, oh, you're, you're just such a nice guy, Neil. <laughs> such a nice guy. <laughs> well, why not? Um, <laughs> if I've... I've I've referred somebody to the podiatrist and the podiatrist has taken them on and they've deemed that something is more appropriate if it makes sense then the ball's in your court but 
it's yeah. just going to backfire if I then start to unravel what you're trying to achieve. It's a good point, though, isn't it? Just be just, yeah. just be human and and twist about this, discuss things. It's not an us and them. It, it's a it's a it's a team approach. I think it's a it's a it's a valid point. Has that ever happened to any of you? Have you ever found yourself in that exact scenario? Um, with with a proximal hamstring cool. tendinopathy, and uh, they were advising all the kind of theory to recommend against like stretching and all the things we tend to lean away from it. And I tried to, su to suggest that, um, Evening of the internet between us. I've dropped out. I've dropped out. Uh, yeah. It's been ideal. There was a comment about female male dominance uh, somewhere. Um, it, got, it got deleted. Yeah, from it got Catherine. Del it got deleted. Ian. What? The I've still got it on my screen. Uh, yeah, I tried to. Yeah, I think it's, it's been, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, why do you guys both, do you guys think that both physio and podiatry are female dominant professions? And I must confess, I, I don't have the stats. I don't know whether that's factually accurate or not. But I mean, I guess we're, as a panel of men, yeah, I don't know whether we're the best place to answer this one. But I mean, it, it, is that a comment that is true? Craig, do you know the, your stats, man? Out of oh, both I, of us? Is I, that I don't, factually I, correct? I, I think there, there's... I, I don't know the figures that they're 50 50 i i don't know um in both professions yeah look i think we've gone over yeah. time anyone I'm else know the numbers physio wise there's there's a lot more female um physiotherapists in australia anyway than male physiotherapists i think based on the okay. last um stats from the uh physio association Sure. Okay, look, and that we have here at the moment are an Yeah. Yeah, look. Sorry, go on. Yeah, look, yeah. I, I, go I think on. on that note, you know, look, I think, I think there's a few problems people are having with internet connections. I think we'll just um, wind up on this. So, look, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Hamish. Thanks, Tom. I will just stop the live stream now. So um, thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll talk next Cheers, week. Cheers, guys.